readers. As the books you are reading become more complicated, time can get pretty tricky. In fact, it can be easy to miss time changes. There won't always be these more obvious phrases and clues. Books aren't like films. I want you to go and watch the clip from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. And as you watch, try to figure out the subtle effects that alert you to a time change and record what you're noticing in your reading notebook. What did you notice? When Harry gets to see back in time to when Snape is a kid, everything is out of focus for a moment and the colors change. Things look different, right? That's one technique used in film to show that time has shifted. Other techniques are things like slow motion or speeding up motion or moving to black and white. Readers, authors can't use film techniques like out of focus or black and white to show shifts in time. Sometimes they'll use phrases like two weeks before or for three years. But authors also have other ways to manipulate time ones that you won't find in a film, but will in a book. Today I want to teach you that when you are investigating how authors use time shifts to develop readers' relationships with characters, another way to find these time shifts is to pay attention to verb tense. Sometimes you'll notice that when the verb tense shifts, time is shifting, and these time shifts may suggest subtle new clues about the character. I want to help you with the tricky work of noticing changes in verb tense. I'm asking you to read like a writer, thinking about the tools. In this case, the grammatical tools a writer uses to control time. I thought we could do an investigation into how writers control time with changing verb tense. To do that, you'll need to know some of the technical terms for verb tense. Why don't you take a moment to read and think about these verb tenses? Which ones do you know well? Which are you unsure of? Which have you studied in another language? See if you can figure them out. If you think of other verb tenses, then you'll want to write them down in your notes as well. Readers, present, past, and future are probably pretty familiar to all of us. The past perfect is when you say something like, he had slept. Often writers combine that with past tense to show sudden breaks in the action. He had slept for about two hours when suddenly the roof fell in. Or they might use past progressive and then past to show something someone was doing for a while which sounds like he was sleeping when the roof fell in. Another tricky one is conditional. That's used when something might happen. So if you said, if I were a ballerina, I would dance for the New York City Ballet. Then the would dance is conditional because it hasn't happened yet. And imperative is super bossy, like a command. It describes when someone orders another person to do something or not do it. Do this. Don't do that. We already know that Matt uses time to deepen our relationship with characters. Let's see how Matt uses these tenses to move time around. You want to get in games. You don't just sit there like a punk, right? You stand up and challenge the baddest dude in the gym, someone like me. Then you do your thing. Understand? His intense eyes will be like knives into your chest. Yes, sir. He'll stand up and nod, then jog back onto the court, shouting, Yo, check ball. Let's go. Let's try matching some of these tense choices to the ones we see in the passage. I'll start, and I'll try to mark a few that are interesting. Watch how I look for verb tense changes. Label them and ask myself, what's interesting about that? You don't just sit there like a punk, right? You stand up and challenge the baddest dude in the gym. Hmm. 
That's imperative. That's the tense that describes what someone should do. You don't just stand there like a punk. You stand up and challenge the baddest dude in the gym. Hmm. Now what I want to ask, what's interesting about the imperative here? What are you thinking? Readers, you might be thinking that imperative tense makes sense because Dante is bossy and is a big man here at the Mooney Gym. It makes sense that Matt makes him seem really bossy, really authoritative by using this tense. Now, this next part is tricky, though. Remember, we are thinking about how verb tenses are part of how authors use time to control readers' relationships to characters. The imperative tense refers to the future, as in one character tells another what they should be doing going forward. By having Dante's advice to the narrator come in the imperative tense, I'm thinking that Matt could be implying that Dante's effect on the narrator goes beyond this one moment. Dante's jabs and snubs to the narrator that we see in other moments are in present tense, meaning they are contained in this brief time at the gym. But his advice, given in imperative tense, stays with the narrator into the future. I'm also respecting Matt more and more. Like you, I never would have noticed this imperative tense if we hadn't been pushing ourselves to look at verb tenses, but it's interesting. I'm realizing how skillfully Matt develops Dante and our relationship with Dante. Let's try one more. I'm going to read another snippet. You're going to want to have these verb tenses um, right near you in your reading notebook. So if you haven't already copied them down, go ahead and do that now. The part that I'm reading is right after our narrator describes how Slim offered him a Coke and hot dog at the gym one day, but he didn't take it because he knew Slim had lost his job. As I read, you might also jot down the verb tenses that you hear, and then we'll go back and talk about that, think about those. Truth was, you turned him down that day because you knew he didn't have any money. He'd lost his security job at the start of the summer. His shoes were falling apart, and you heard he'd been evicted from his apartment. Saying no, you thought, was the right thing to do. But on the car ride home that afternoon, your pop shook his head in disappointment. He turned down his news show for the first time all summer. When a man with nothing offers to give you something, he said, you take it. You do? Always. Why? He glanced at you as he merged on the freeway. You just do, all right? So you probably noticed some very subtle verb tense choices, like Slim's shoes were falling apart, which shows that they had been falling apart for a while, and he had been evicted, which means he'd been evicted before he offers our boy the hot dog. So all of that makes us more sympath with, 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 with Slim. I'm thinking it also shows that Slim's condition is getting worse. And to me, all this serves to highlight the dad's advice that Slim has nothing. And the narrator should have given Slim the honor of accepting his offer. You might also have noticed that the dad uses the imperative tense, like Dante. Like Dante, the dad doesn't talk much, but when he does, he expects to be listened to. He is giving advice for the future, and when he turns down the radio, it's past tense, to show he does this only the one time. It seems Matt uses these tenses to highlight the importance of the moment and the advice that follows. Readers, even if we don't notice the tenses, even if we don't know what they're called, which really doesn't matter, they have an effect on us. Once again, I'm going to jot this thinking in our notes. So I added to what Matt does that he has Dante speak in imperative tense. 
possible reasons for this are to show Dante's influence on the boy, that it goes beyond the summer. Yesterday, you looked for places in your novels where time changed. As you read today, go back to one of those places and mark some of the verb tenses. Then think about how those tenses show shifts in time. Readers, you're not going to read every page of your novel this way. That would be impossible. But this work will make you more alert to verb tense, and it should also make you more alert to how those tense changes often to affect readers in subtle ways. As you go off to read today, take a moment to think about your choices. If you're near the end of your novel, you may want to either reread or choose another short story to finish up your author's study with. If you're not near the end, power on. Perhaps lighten up your jotting and really try to get a serious number of pages read. All right, readers, off you go.